I think people complain about it. I think it's beautiful. I, I like all things in their place and in their time, right? I mean, winter is right. charismatic in her own ways. You just have to meet her where she is, right? Well, it's if kind you... of funny because, you know, when it snows in December, everyone's thrilled. When it snows in April, everyone's like, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. Move on, move on. We've had some we've had some snowstorms in May in Chicago. So yeah, that that really hurts. So Ireland has joined Turkey, Botswana. Yeah, again, yeah. Botswana. Wonderful. Hey, Mark, <laughs> Boston. Hello. Hey, Mark Farmer. Nice to see you on here. <laughs> all right. Give it some from all over the place. One more minute. Hello, Mauricio. My goodness, it's been a long time from Ecuador, Syria. <clears throat> Philippines are coming in super fast now. All right. Tampa, Florida. That's where I am today. Yes, Tampa, Florida. Beautiful. India, welcome. Pakistan, welcome. All right. One more minute and we're going to start up here because we have lots to do today. We have lots to talk about. Saudi we only have, have 71% of the planet to cover. So yeah, uh, was, lakes and river. it's only 99.9% .9 of the livable space on the planet. Come on, let's go. We got this 25 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Qatar. Yeah. They're still coming in. Yeah. It's, you know, I, uh, I, I teach a course uh, on health and global and in, in a course on health in the global environment. And uh, I, I get two hours to teach the entire ocean, public health, history of fisheries, uh, ocean ecosystems, you know, ecosystem contributions, all of that. It's like two hours. Why not? So, yeah. and then somebody says, "Can we just do it like quick, quickly in twenty minutes?" <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Man. It's good. <laughs> well, you're certainly an expert in in this field too, so uh, this conversation will go easily and quickly. So, oh yeah, it's going to be fun. Well, <laughs> I'm going to sort of get get started here. I know there's going to be more people coming in. The issue is, is that when we open this up, it takes time for for people to uh to kind of roll through here so um as people are joining i'm going to begin our our um our webcast so this is this is the first time since last year that we've all been together so uh, a, a very happy new year to everybody and um we have a lot in store for this year you know i was just talking to lynn um before we all sort of got on here about where, what we're gonna do this year, how we're gonna move forward. Um, Lynn is the one who, who works the magic in, in Paris that make all this happen. And um, one of the things before we get going, I do wanna call your attention to, if you look at the bottom of your, of your Zoom there, you'll see right in the middle, a thing that says polls. So please, at some point today during this um, presentation, please click on that because what we're doing is we're asking those of you who come to this all the time and those of you who made this is your, perhaps your first time joining us, take a moment, take a minute, fill that out and just um, tell us what, you, what you're thinking. Tell us what you, you know, what, what you think you'd like us to do moving forward. Tell us what topics you're interested in. Maybe there's something we did before where you were like, wow, that was amazing, but I want to dig deeper into that, et cetera. So this is your opportunity to hit the poll, tell us what you're thinking, and then we're going to go back and look at that and uh, plan out the next number of months for this. So we're really giving you what you are interested in. So that's the power of world chefs. <laughs> so the other thing is just to kind of alert you to the fact that we are, I mean, you know, we, we have this wonderful online curriculum now. So everybody around the world uh, through the Chef's Academy can study sustainability and really study it from a chef's perspective. So please take some time to do that. But we don't sit still at the Feed the Planet Committee. We continue to think about what else we can do and how we can do it better uh, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things we're thinking about, and this is kind of where Barton comes in, who just walked away, who's yeah. <laughs> in his home kitchen, um, is, is, to, is to think about if we can develop some additional educational resources with experts to kind of help dig deep into those different areas, you know, of agricultural, animal husbandry, uh, energy, water, uh, seafood, waste, all those you know topic areas we've talked about, but to dig deep, you could take a separate class in that um, to deepen your knowledge. So, so stay tuned. There may be something that has to do with Barton, maybe, wink, wink, that maybe has to do with seafood, wink, wink. Uh, so um, 
yeah, please keep your your um, your eyes and ears open for that. So let's get started because today we are super thrilled to have Barton Siever joining us. And I'm gonna I've known Barton for I don't know a long time, and we've we've run into each years. other. But I'm guessing, yeah, you know, we kind of Maybe bump 20? into each other at yeah. conferences and. But let me, for the rest of you, so Barton Siever, and I read this from his bio here, is one of the world's leading sustainable seafood experts and educators. After an illustrious career as an award-winning chef, he became an explorer with the National Geographic Society. His expertise had garnered him positions with the United States Culinary Ambassador Corporation, the New England Aquarium, and the Harvard School of Public Health, leading initiatives informing consumers and institutions about how health, actually how food choices promote healthier people, environment, and thriving communities, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. That sort of triangle image in my head. An internationally recognized speaker, Barton delivers lectures, seminars, and demos to a multitude of audiences. That is absolutely true all <laughs> over the place. He's written seven seafood-centric books, including American Seafood, and has contributed to dozens of publications and media programs. He's also the founder of Coastal of the Coastal Culinary Academy and Seafood Literacy and SeafoodLiteracy.com, a multi-platform initiative that seeks to increase seafood consumption through seafood-specific culinary education for all levels of cooks. That was a mouthful, Barton. <laughs> welcome. Welcome it's to delightful. Well, you know, it's an honor and a pleasure that, that we have all as chefs to dedicate ourselves to, to such a craft as hospitality. And I, I just, I found my interest and allowed them to continuously evolve. Uh, and that's, that's one of been the hallmark of one, one of the hallmarks of my career is that I like to uh, invent the next step and sort of evolve strategically. And that, that's all led me here to you today. So thank you all very much, everyone attending for your participation and allowing me your audience. I much appreciate it. Awesome. It is great to have you here. So we're just going to jump right in because time is always of the essence here. And again, for everybody who's joining us, if you have questions, there is that Q&A button. Please click it there. We're going to try to get to those at the end because I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of questions. But let me just start off by a little background. So uh, chef, chef turned kind of seafood expert. How did that happen? I mean, what was the moment in your sort of professional mm -hmm. career where and maybe it wasn't a moment, maybe it was a maybe it was a, over a period of time where you go, look, uh, we need to do things differently. I mean, what? how did that happen for you? Well, it, it, when I started off as, in, in a, as a chef in a kitchen, so I lived and worked all over the world. I, I was in Morocco working as a fisherman out of the coastal town of Asuera. I was in Spain working in these tiny little coastal villages and towns. Uh, and then it was a chef named Jose Andres. Uh, whom many of you, I hope, know. Uh, he called me up in Spain and said, come back to America and, and run my, my flagship for me. And I came back and, and you know, under his tutelage and mentorship, uh, my passion for seafood grew to understand just the role that chefs play. You know, we are, we are the central cog, the nucleus in the wheel of humanity. Uh, there's a great quote from MFK Fisher. It says, first we eat and then we do everything else. And I just began to see the role of a chef and our responsibilities, not only to help those who enter our front doors to thrive, to sustain them, but also to sustain the people that show up at our back doors, right? The food delivery, you know, with, without farmers, without fishermen, there is no food for us. There is no chef. Um, and so that idea of full circle hospitality uh, was always uh, very much, I was very much engaged in seafood just being my passion. Uh, it was easy at the time. I, there was also a lot of big stories out there from, you know, Chilean sea bass going from culinary darling to, you know, <laughs> on the way to extinction. We had Orange Ruffy appear out of nowhere on our menus and then exit our menus. We had, uh, you know, a growing understanding of the impacts of aquaculture. And so there was a lot of these stories and a lot of opportunity that we had that I had as a chef to, to take up the mantle of these conversations. But it wasn't until, so I, I ran all of my restaurants on an evolving platform of sustainability, putting it onto the plate in different ways in each location, whether that was from waste, whether that was uh, how we treated our workers, whether it was you know seafood itself and diversity there. Uh, but it was a moment when I had become a National Geographic Explorer, and that is as sexy of a job as you can imagine it being. Uh, 
And my, I, I went out into the world to help chefs, to help people reduce the impact that we have on marine ecosystems, right? That, that's what sustainability is all about, right? Reducing our impact on the world. But what I very quickly learned and came to understand was that sustainability is about that. Yes, we have a responsibility to our planet, but we also have a responsibility to ourselves. And that the end result of sustainability is the endurance of thriving humans. And with that in mind, I began to look at not just, hey, chef, we need to fix seafood, but maybe, hey, chef, maybe we can use seafood to fix a lot of what else is wrong, whether it's from pop, you know, very negative public health outcomes due to our diet, whether it's you know environmental solutions that we find in blue foods in our oceans, uh, and also well as to economic development opportunities and how seafood contributes to a cyclical evolution of getting things better all the time. And that's why now I consider myself a seafood evangelist. It's my mission to get more people across all demographics eating more seafood. And chefs, begins with you, and which is why I'm so excited to be here today. So this is a really interesting thing because you know, and you and I were talking about this previously about, you know, sort of seafood as a solution, because I think what, what many of us hear is that seafood is the problem or a problem versus a solution. So can we, can we kind of unpack that a little bit? Sure. Because, you know, if you, if you, again, in many sustainability circles, it's about, wow, we just have to eat less fish. We have to eat less meat. We have to eat, you know, um, pulses and grains for the rest of our life. But you're saying a little bit of a different narrative, which is no, actually this, you know, the oceans that, you know, seafood can, can be the solution or part of the solution. Unpack that please. Part of the solution for sure. Bottom line, plants, 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 plants. We need to be eating a veg forward diet. That's just the way it is. Many people on the planet, most of them do exactly that. So I think in Western hospitality, certainly, but in global hospitality, there's the idea that you know, we're sort of eating from a center of the plate aesthetic. You know, Chris, you and I were laughing about the fact that we, Chris and I read menus from right to left, meaning I don't really even care what the protein is, like Atlantic salmon, fine. Everybody has Atlantic salmon. Like that, that's interesting to me how you source that, but really it's the vegetables. It's what's on the plate that makes you unique, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but you look at most menus and you have, you know, Atlantic salmon, 12 point font bold, blah, 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 blah. All the stuff that makes us unique, fun, and creative in 10 point font, regular typeface. And then the price in 12 point font bold. It's like, where do we, where are we making our decisions? Well, it's, it's obvious just as chefs, we're telling people where to make their decisions on literally how we design our menus. Protein, bold. Price, bold. What really makes our jobs fun? We diminish that. So certainly we need to be focused on that language and, and just literally designing it. Make it bigger on the menu. Tell, you know, tell folks that's where you are on the menu. Uh, but to unpack the... Uh, Let's let's start with the environmental impacts of seafood. So certainly there is a lot of very horrible things that go on and there's a lot still to fix with seafood, but we have the tools by which we can make great decisions on this, whether it's Marine Stewardship Council, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, uh, best aquaculture practices, whether it's, uh, you know, Good Fish UK, whether, I mean, there's all programs all over the place that are using great science to tell us what we need to know. But the things that are on the top of that list and the things that are getting better and improving towards it, when we look at them in that center of the plate aesthetic, so a lot of the times we look at, is this seafood sustainable or not, without looking at it in terms of how we use it, which is, well, center of the plate. So let's look at it against beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, turkey, goat, the things that we actually eat. And across five very, five very important metrics, fresh water use, big one, antibiotic use, big one greenhouse gas emissions, land use alterations, and feed conversion ratio, meaning how much food goes into a cow to get food out of that cow. Mm -hmm. Across the board, seafood comes in on top. And this is just because it has a fin up in the sustainability game. You and me and pigs and chickens and cows and goats, we're all fighting gravity. 
and atmospheric pressure. We spend a lot of energy to keep our brains warm. We have to build big bones just to withstand the environment that we live in. Fish? <laughs> nah, dude, that's cool. I float. They just live in a naturally buoyant environment, which is far more gentle. They're just more biologically efficient beings. So across the board, seafood, if we're looking at a center of the plate animal protein, seafood is kind of the top choice. When we look at it from an economic standpoint, so seafood is 2% of our global food supply, 2%. And yet one in 11 people on this planet's livelihood depends solely on seafood. One in 11 people rely on 2% of the food supply. To give you the converse of that, 98% of our food supply is agriculture, and that supplies 25% of the livelihoods. So we're talking almost a fourfold increase in, sort of, in terms of the overall impact. And then when we look at aquaculture in particular, over 70% of people who are involved in aquaculture are women. And when we want to solve problems on this planet, and when we want to look at solutions, women are an economic development for women is right at the nucleus of almost every single issue we face or would have incredible results in terms of positive overall impact. And then when we look at public health, so the Global cost of our food system is about $19 trillion. And that is what it costs us for the environment, which is about $7 trillion, and $11 trillion of negative public health outcomes just due to the food that we eat. But our global food supply is only worth $9 trillion. There's an $11 trillion gap there in terms of the economic opportunity and what we are costing ourselves just through what we eat. So when I look at all of these combined and I say, wow, you know, here we are at reaching these planetary limits, uh, you know, these very big heartrending questions of how are we going to feed people? And we look at the fact that we, we have this food system of foods that are more efficient, that we know how to capture sustainably. We know how to farm sustainably. And that we as chefs can directly invest in by increasing its presence on our menu, increasing our storytelling about this, by which we become part of a solution. And with aquaculture in particular, we become architects of a brand new food system. Last time we got to invent a food system was 10,000 years ago when we first planted the seeds of modern society with agriculture. And with aquaculture, which is only about 60 years old, we chefs are the architects of a food system that we want to see, that we can develop within the scope of values and virtues that we as chefs believe in and espouse and serve forth with love every day. So let's so let's talk real quickly about you know wild seafood, and then I'm going to ask you about aquaculture specifically. But wild seafood, you know, and, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense, obviously, that, you know, it's it's environmentally smart. It's good for us from a health perspective and it, and it supports communities, especially women uh, in, in, in business. And so that's this kind of triangle picture I have in my head that it does all those things. But sort of going back to, you know, what we're hearing, what we're hearing is, you know, fishing stocks around the world are, are, are you know, wild now you know, are sort of, are, are crumbling. The, the supplies aren't as what they used to be. The fish are getting smaller. We should eat less and less of these, which of course runs contrary to that model of, well, no, it's it's good for us. It's it's environmentally less impactful and it's good for, you know, you know communities. So how, so where's the, where's the disconnect there? Yeah, uh, the disconnect is in, I, I, part of this, and, and I'm not just laying blame on this, but the media does not sell positive headlines. It's just not their business model. Uh, we have you know, movies such as Seaspiracy, which came out in the last couple of years, which is a major you know, impact uh, film here in America. And, and to me, that's just sort of a postured panic of you know, we're going to take truths, but we're going to pull them out of context, at which point truths become BS. Uh, or can for certain, and, and we know this, this happens in politics all the time. It's just, 
spin and, and people putting their own context onto otherwise truths that doesn't tell the full story. Now, certainly, as I mentioned, there is so much yet to fix about fisheries and, and with aquaculture as well. So this is not a broad brushstroke to say that all seafood is good seafood, but rather to say that categorically seafood can be, and we have example of plenty of example of it being such. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of work left to be done. Groups like the World Bank and some other uh, international environmental nonprofits look at a reduction in total wild capture fisheries by 50%. Uh, that's going to have some outsized economic impacts on the 2 billion people on this planet that rely on that for both livelihoods as well as for uh, primary source of protein. But then we have science such as coming out of the University of Washington and their future fisheries program uh, and in the eminent, eminent scientist, uh, Ray Hilborn, was looking at from United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization numbers that about 80% of the seafood that we eat on this planet that comes from wild capture fisheries is considered managed sustainably. Huh. Now, that doesn't mean 80% of the fish we catch is sustainable because a lot of the fish we catch doesn't go towards edible consumption. It goes towards reduction and food feed. It goes into moisturizers and linoleum tiles, and it feeds pigs and cows and chickens and other fish. Um, so there's a lot to do in this. But what we're not hearing, it's not that the the, the headlines are necessarily negative. That or The negative headlines that we're hearing are necessarily false. It's that we're not hearing the inverse of that, which are the stories of hope and solutions. And from that, which we draw the conclusion that actually the tide is rising on this, we're getting better and that the solutions are at hand and that they're for us, importantly, to invest in as chefs, to invest our learning in and to invest our menu space. So let me let me training. ask you on. So let me ask you on that, because, you know, chefs are uh, busy. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, right. You are <laughs> not too busy to show up to this important event. <laughs> it's just a relaxed job being a chef. No, but I mean, you know, there's there's a million things tugging at your time every day. So how do we, so two questions. Number one, how do we know which are the proper wild, caught again, wild now, we'll get to aquaculture in a second, but wild, you know, which are the wild ones we should be using? And how do we communicate that to customers who maybe are, are thinking, oh, I don't know if I should be eating that because, you know, we're they've seen the, the movies and, you know, et cetera. So where do we go for that information? Sure. Uh, there, there are global uh, institutions like the Marine Stewardship Council that I think it does a very good job. Uh, I believe that about 15% of global fisheries are in fact uh, certified something uh, to that. Mm -hmm. and forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recall a number long heard long ago on that, but the bottom line is that those those products are out there and we do have access to them. Another thing I would trust is you know, local fisheries organizations. And I know that we've got people from literally everywhere on this call here. Local and regional government are going to be different in the way they, they, they approach things. Uh, you know, there, there are going to be some some that are lagging behind in terms of mm -hmm. the accuracy of the science that they're using and how quickly they're evolving their management. But we have ex global examples, uh, Australia, New Zealand, a lot of the EU uh, and UK fisheries are really managed very well. US fisheries are among the very best managed in the world, Iceland as well. You know, you have states within America like Alaska, which produces about 60% of our total production here in the United States where sustainability is, is written directly into their state constitution. Mm -hmm. So we do have these examples. We do have a globalized seafood trade. About 50% of, and then this is jumping into aquaculture, but about 50% of farmed salmon globally is certified as sustainably produced. And with a goal of getting that up to about 75%. So, the bottom line is that this product is out there. And Chef, I know that your time is super valuable. So guess what? There's a lot of people that spend their whole day thinking about seafood. That's your seafood vendor. And that's your greatest and most straightforward relationship. 
you know, if you don't trust them, well, you should be using a different vendor to begin with, right? I mean, that's the first thing we buy with our purchasing dollars is trust. So engage them. And this is something that I did. And, and maybe if sustainability isn't already like, oh, here's all of the sustainability offerings we, we have, by creating that interest, you're creating an entire system by which knowledge gets fed in, values get raised up, and practices can improve. So this is, you know, with that word you've used several times is important, and that's the word trust, you know, because, you know, in this, in this day of, of free-flowing information, it's always about finding the, 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 the true information, factual information, stuff you can trust. Um, really quickly, and we're going to jump into a couple of questions here. This is probably an unfair question with the, with the really quickly with it, but Give us a little just overview of the state of aquaculture, because, you know, aquaculture is another thing that that we have. Um, you know, there's there's not a week that goes by that I'm not hearing about, you know, success stories. But there's, there, but then there's also, yeah, but you, you don't want to get that product from there because, ooh, you know, you don't you don't know if that stuff is swimming in. And, you know, um, where are we at with this? Because, you know, it seems to me that aquaculture is a really good solution for producing you know, sustainable protein uh, sources. But give us yeah. just an overview. What do you, what do you see them? So uh, we've had aquaculture on this planet for thousands of years. We, there's examples of it back in China and Hawaiian tribal culture, <clears throat> all over the place. However, from a global industry in terms of a commodity and trade, uh, aqu the first net pen aquaculture, the first net of salmon that went into the water, went into the water about 60 years ago, okay? That is very, very young. I mean, think about a computer 60 years ago couldn't do what, you know, the computer the size of a country can't, couldn't do what my iPhone can do, you know, just casually in my pocket. Industries advance and they evolve. And certainly within the early days of aquaculture, we got a lot of stuff wrong because we were literally starting fresh. We didn't know really what we were doing. We didn't even know which species to grow. And currently we only grow about 30 species of seafood in mm -hmm. aquaculture commercially. And yet there's tens of thousands of species out there. You know, it's taken us 10,000 years to get all the way down to the perfect chicken, right? 10,000 years to get from the auroch all the way down to the Holstein cow. Um, with salmon, we're, we're on generation 40, 50, 60, you know, like we just don't have that depth of knowledge. But the pace of innovation, the pace of change is so radical that it is one of the most quickly evolving industries there is. Mm -hmm. Not just food industries, but any industry. And the amount of money that's flowing into this from a technological side uh, is incredible. Just innovations in feed, whether we're talking about algae-based feeds, novel feeds, black soldier flies. I mean, I don't want to dive into the weeds here on this, but to say that the industry did earn a bit of our a bad reputation. But it is time to lend our, lend our trust and to give it a second look and to see where it is now and to see where it is going. Because we know how to do it right. We know the virtues and values we get from it. And we know that it can produce delicious, healthy food too, which is ultimately the trust that our guests place in us to deliver to them. This is super optimistic. <laughs> Just saying. I mean, it's it's really good to hear this because, uh, again, we hear all kinds of stuff. But um, all right, I have some questions. Um, first one is: How can seafood help world chefs alleviate poverty around the world? Wow, That's a really interesting question. Yeah. So, getting right back to the fact that a lot of aquaculture happens in the developing world, uh, and in those developing economies. Uh, you have a traditional male workforce. And with a brand new economy, such as aquaculture, you're not displacing a traditional male workforce. And so it's creating this economic opportunity for women, which is incredibly important. Uh, and that is the number one, number one sort of nucleus cause to alleviate poverty is empowering and educating women. So right there, uh, 
aquaculture provide aquaculture in particular, but fisheries provide sort of a, a nearly direct avenue to invest in that. Now, are those jobs the best jobs? Are they the top executive jobs? No. But are they creating economic improvement and opportunity on the ground? Yes. And there's plenty of examples of this the globe over. Uh, also, this is a brand new system. This is not uh, replacing agriculture. This is not replacing wild capture fisheries. To, to some extent, it does, but it, it's not a stand-in for. Uh, we're seeing that aquaculture can happen anywhere. It's happening in dilapidated malls in America. It's happening in old factories. It happens on land. It happens in freshwater. It happens in salt water. The fact that we can bring aquaculture directly into urban centers to create jobs, to create food justice and access, sovereign access to quality food. And, you know, there's examples here of, of women's prisons growing tilapia. We have uh, efforts in Milwaukee, a town here in America with a great deal of poverty and food access issues, where this product is being literally grown directly within the community of those that need it most. And so there's this very beneficial, positive upcycling of opportunity that aquaculture can represent. Now, it takes $10 million or so U.S. to open a salmon net pen farm off the coast. How much it costs to create a tilapia pond in Kenya or in southern Mexico, in Jalisco, or I mean, in Tabasco, or, you know, just not a whole lot. So there's different areas of aquaculture, and we shouldn't think of it as this monolithic thing. Aquaculture is not aquaculture, the same way agriculture is not the same everywhere, right? So we need to think about it in terms of what are, what are those different modules? What works here? What works there? And do so, do that thinking with the purpose of how does this best help people to endure and to thrive? Love it. All right. How do we judge the supplier for his quality? As in India, there is no trust from suppliers as quality keeps differing. Hmm. Well, <laughs> tough, tough question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a tough question given, you know, the entire ecosystem of information and, and economics and history and culture there. Um, you know, bottom line is there are international sources around sustainability, which I, I believe you're, you might be talking about in terms of quality here, just quality, uh, overall quality of product, meaning its wholesomeness and is it deserving of being served in our establishments. Uh, that's really where those programs like the Marine Stewardship Council come into play. Best aquaculture practices, which I know is very active in Indian seafood production, especially around uh, Indian farm shrimp, which uh, is a huge part of the aquaculture economy. So those, those methods of following the information all the way back to the water do exist. And that's where I would really place your trust in those. Now, because those are brands that have, uh, especially Marine Stewardship Council and Aquaculture Stewardship Council, have chain of custody auditing, meaning if it's got that label on it, they can guarantee to you that it came from the right source. There's no fraud in the supply chain there. Now, that's where, really where I would go. But also with, if you have the opportunity to focus on regional or localized fisheries, then you're, you're, one, you're many steps closer to the actual relationship with the person on the water. And relationships, as we know, are the bedrock of trust, right? If you're creating a sense of responsibility to each other uh, for truth and trust and quality, that's really where all boats rise. So if it's okay with everyone that's listening, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this go another five minutes because I have a <laughs> huge number of questions that are coming in. I knew this would happen. <laughs> oh, anybody, I'm, I'm here for the long haul. Anybody that needs to drop off, I appreciate you and your time. So please don't, because this is this is really good. Um, uh, so yeah, so maybe we can just kind of bang through these quickly here. On a yeah, price hey, perspective, price. seafood in my hometown and where I'm currently staying can be expensive, and that's why seafood is not a first choice of protein. It's not a first choice of protein source. Can these sustainable practices also 
uh, answer the issue on cost? Yes, uh, the, the economic science is out there that we know it is cheaper to produce seafood sustainably than it is to do so unsustainably. As it relates to the cost of land animal proteins, uh, I can't speak to everywhere, but in the United States, land animal protein is artificially cheap. Seafood is not expensive. It is rationally priced. It's the beef where we pay for it once with our taxes to subsidize feed and oil and fertilizer. We pay for it again uh, at the grocery store when we buy it. We pay for it again at the hospital when the Western diet sends us there. We pay for it again with climate change and all of its impacts there. And then we pay for it again with the lack of human rights that are within the system. So if you actually added up those five costs to the cost of your ground beef, it would be about up here and seafood would be here. So the real cost, true cost, which is not what you are, you know, that's not what your P&Ls and, and your, your monthlies are based on. But bottom line is seafood is rationally priced generally around the planet and meat and animal land animal proteins are not. I would also suggest that that has to maybe be a portion size issue, but yes, um, really so interesting to that 40%, it's estimated almost maybe even 50% of all seafood globally is thrown out before we ever get to use it. So if you want to reduce the cost of seafood, don't throw it out, right? It's the least sustainable form of seafood, that which gets processed and never feeds a person. So, and then portion size, as we know, is a huge thing. Three ounces of portion on a plate is adequate for what our body needs to be sustained. And it's best for our food costs as well. All right. I'm going to have to just do one more question. There's probably 20 more questions here. Oh my goodness. This is amazing guys. Um, and, and the question here was basically on what are your thoughts on land-based aquaculture versus traditional marine pens? Uh, I like both. Both are evolving. Land-based aquaculture has the advantage of being able to be placed within the population centers that it is seeking to feed. Uh, it is also taking advantage of existing footprint of of development. So dilapidated factories, unused malls, et cetera. Um, you also have a great opportunity for um, you know, solar energy to be used in, in these facilities. So that's why I particularly like land-based aquaculture, but I don't like it over marine net pen uh, for any, any reason other than that they both serve slightly different purposes and both have slightly different economic sort of trajectories, but ultimately they both produce or both are able to produce seafood worth our attentions. All right, two really fast questions because they're, they're really interesting. One is, um, there was a question here about uh, somebody finding a farm age grouper for the first time. What other, are, what other um, seafood fish products are coming down the pike that maybe we don't see as an aqua, aquaculture product today, but they're coming? Yeah. I, a lot of them, hundreds of them, as we begin to better understand what species are well adapted, just suited to being farmed. Uh, we started farming salmon because there is a market for farmed salmon. They knew they could sell it. Uh, now we're beginning to farm species that actually are farmable well. Barramundi, cobia, kingfish, jacks. We have groupers, there's cod, there's flounders, there's halibuts. Uh, there's all sorts of different uh, species that we're beginning to mess around with, redfish, blackfish. I mean, it's really incredible. And what's very incredible is the new technology of integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Instead of just farming one species, we're farming the salmon, but also kelp and mussels and scallops and sea cucumbers and uni around this so that the input is the same, but the output is exponentially greater. Oh, that's super interesting. There was a comment over here also just about the fact that, you know, there's there's a lot of um, waters, fresh waters that are polluted and, and you know, becomes an issue with eating fish from freshwater sources. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a there's a huge and significant issue around this, especially with PFAS. Uh, I can't remember the chemical name of this uh, concentrations in water that are that can be way above what is safe and healthy for us to eat. So freshwater sources, I, it's important that aquaculturists are paying attention to that, uh, but oftentimes those sources can be drawn from aquifers or deep water, deep wells. Um, 
And so there is, you know, there is water that's not polluted with this, but generally surface water is where those pollutants can, can aggregate because, well, there's a lake, right? And so all the water from that drains off the land ends up in that lake and brings with it whatever we put on those farming fields. Um, so that's where the issues come from. So it just pays, it, it, it would pay, behoove us to pay attention to where those water sources are. But ultimately, one of the reasons why I like this is that it creates a brand new economy of people that care about water quality. <laughs> and as we know, capital kind of drives, well, much of everything in our world. And so if nobody really pays the price of having dirty water, well, then, yeah, kind of things go on as normal. But if there is a, a generation of sentinel stewards who say, no, my economy, our food source depends on quality water, then things happen and we end up changing the cycles of destruction. And I think we're going to end it there because that really is the, the, the message that we have talked about in terms of uh, what we, you know, what we talk about here, which is that everything is interconnected. And, and when it comes to sustainability, it's all connected. So that was a great example of that. Um, there were so many more questions, but I just, I want to, I want to put something out there for all of you, because I think listening to Barton today was, uh, for me personally, really, really educational. I always learn things from you. A million okay. thank yous. And, you know, what a great resource. And like I said, please, Keep watching the World Chef's uh, informational, you know, emails you get, um, because uh, there's there's a strong likelihood that we'll be uh, we'll be working with Barton in the sort of hopefully not too distant future here, and we'll be able to dig a lot deeper. And a lot of the questions that I was looking at, um, I think we'll be able to answer because there is a lot to talk about, and I think that as chefs we just need to get more and more. Um, educated on all of these issues. And I see that Barton, thank you. You put your, your email there for people. If you wish to send him an email, uh, quick shout out to the folks in Paris, Lynn and Isla, who has just joined us. Uh, you guys, again, you know, you make it all happen. Um, Barton, I just can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day, out of your morning to, um, to join us and to teach everybody here, because this is really this is a world community of chefs, of cooks, of, of new culinarians who are here because you wanna do better, you wanna learn and you wanna make sure we're doing the right stuff and that we are you know, influencing the world around us uh, by virtue of the uh, of the power of the white jacket. So with or that- the power of the blue jacket. Yeah, blue we'll is good. Talk yeah, about seafood, <laughs> represent, you know? I actually wear, wear a gray one most of my time, but yeah, so yes, but- I just want to thank you, um, Barton, once again. This, is, this has been great. And to everybody who's joined us, it's always a pleasure to see you. We'll see you next month uh, for more. So take care, everybody.